What's up guys, my name is Khan, and we're back today with more gear blocks and it has been a while since we played gear blocks But the reason is pretty simple I've been sort of waiting for an update and I want to read you guys what the dev actually said in recent patch notes 0.7.8797 The dev was talking about hey everyone it's time for a long overdue update And the big thing that I'm waiting for is combustion engines and you'll see he says by this point I was hoping to have combustion engines done I tried a purely physics based approach using separate cylinders pistons conrod and crank rigid bodies Bodies and applying a force to the piston based on the current angle of the crank. This worked reasonably well, but had problems with phantom forces where the engine would get a torque applied to it, sometimes flipping over the vehicle it's in. To me, that sounds a bit like a suspension glitch kind of problem in scrap mechanic. Also, using physics for all the parts like this has RPM limitations, and it doesn't scale well for sim performance. So I've decided to change tack slightly, and I still want to keep the appearance of the moving parts, i.e. pistons and con rods, but my plan is to now procedurally animate these in code. There's not really any need to use physics, as these parts won't collide with anything when inside the engine. To apply torque to the crankshaft, I'm working on something similar to electric motors, but with a different torque curve. Hopefully I'll be able to get this done soon, but in the meantime, I thought it would be good to get a small update out. And he talks about a few of the update nodes, modifying a few parts parts and changing some part behaviors including adding a no clip part capabilities which is kind of cool so you can now have parts that don't collide with each other if you want that in your vehicles i'm kind of excited because this game right now only has electric motors and i'm really excited to actually work on a car chassis that has some combustion engine and i was hoping to sort of wait until that update came out and work on combustion engines uh but obviously as the dev was saying it might be a little bit so we're gonna get back to working on our test chassis and just sort of work on everything else that isn't actually the engine itself and what i wanted to talk about today more specifically is ackerman angle and how ackerman angle affects your driving ability now we have our test chassis before where we had these piston linear actuators on it which would affect our steering geometry and of course this is sort of as you can see we've got our steering knuckle here and then we've got this straight rigid beam i know this is on an axle but that's actually a rigid connection it can't move up and down because we haven't put suspension on it yet but then we've got a slight ackerman angle on this which is this pivot point you can see is outside of this pivot point and what ackerman angle is more specifically if you don't know is it's actually the ability for your car to you know change the diameter of the inside wheel versus the outside wheel so if you'll notice when we turn to the right that right side well let's go this way that right side wheel as we turn to the right actually has a steeper angle to it than the left side wheel and this makes sense because as you go around a corner the inside wheel has to actually go on a tighter radius than the outside wheel and if we turn it to the left you can see the same thing the left wheel has a tighter radius than the right wheel so what i want to try and do today is i'm going to modify this chassis slightly we're going to rip off these top actuators because we were using those for camber angle and we don't need them we're going to make them a rigid bar we're going to push the front wheels out a little bit further and what i want to do is i want to replace this piece here with a custom piece that we build ourselves and what i want to try and do with that custom piece is change the ackerman geometry a little bit so first thing we're going to do is we're going to actually like extend this back and basically the ackerman angle is if we take the line that we draw from these two pivot points and we take the line we draw from these two pivot points and we draw those as two giant lines all the way back like this you know we could then see what angle that is at and and what i want to try and do is do not only a standard ackerman where they come in but we can try an inverted ackerman as well where we push the other way and have the inside wheel push a little less and i just want to see what the little differences are with those i had a comment on the last video saying that race cars actually use an inverted ackerman and that is true for some cases in f1 for example they use an inverted ackerman angle where the outside wheel actually has a sharper radius than the inside wheel and the reason behind that is actually because in f1 they're accounting for the sliding forces that are happening across the wheel so with your standard car that doesn't really happen because with a standard car they're expecting the wheel to maintain grip all the time but with an f1 car the wheels are constantly sliding even though it looks like they're taking a corner smooth there's a lateral slide that happens as the wheel sort of slides across the tarmac and they're using the outside angle as a sharper angle to account for that plus the car loads to the outside as it goes through a corner momentum puts more weight on the outside wheel maintains that grip and blah 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 lots of cool stuff so first thing we're gonna do we're gonna rip this apart let's just delete some stuff here and we're gonna just take these off and we're going to push these out a little bit further the front wheels are gonna get a little bit wider now on this because uh you know i want to make sure that we have the uh you know enough space let's just let's just throw that back in there it's fine for now but i want to make sure we have enough space to really mess around with this knuckle geometry so that's going to get deleted this is all going to get deleted uh yeah get rid of all that get rid of this Get rid of that, no problem. And those are the two pistons. We'll delete these as well. Coming off the steering bar. 
and we'll replace them with something that isn't, uh, isn't that. We'll not use the pistons anymore. Really cool that you can do that. The pistons, again, on that were to adjust the toe angle, and then, of course, we had, uh, other pistons to adjust the camber angle, which, again, not really super important. So we're just gonna clear all this out. Now, again, it has been a while since I played Gearblocks, so... I might not know all the controls, but I was really hoping to wait for the combustion engine upgrades because uh, I think that's just going to be super, super cool when we finally get that in the game. Uh, that's just going to be great. So we're going to extend that out to eight. No problem. And we'll put this one out to eight. And then we're going to duplicate this part and we're just going to put it like this. So that'll be the bottom piece. Uh, and then we'll do the same thing like this. Grab this one and flip it this way. And that'll be that. Okay. And then we're going to need a little rod... Uh, like so we'll flip this up and then that could be our first point and again I guess I should build this on one side first but there we go so that'll be our bottom bar again this is a rigid connection so it's not going to pivot with any sort of suspension and then we need to make another bar that goes across the top so we'll literally just duplicate this whole thing and uh, same deal not going to have any sort of suspension or uh, a movement on this just yet but I really want to just sort of mess around with accurate angle and see how it, it's going to change things. Let's actually move this back too, just to make sure that we have lots of space to mess around with it. So now we're going to have to get probably just one of these members, like so, and put it up here. And we're going to have to change this connection to be a rotating connection. And then we're going to do the same thing over here, like this, and again, a rotating connection. And then what we basically have to do is if we take another member like so, and we rotate it this way, and put it hopefully into there and let's make that like four now depending on how far out we mount the axle that attaches to the steering rack that's going to determine our Ackerman angle going to the back so it should be pretty cool stuff so if we take for example another one of these pins and we put our pin here right right on the edge this would be zero Ackerman angle if we're steering from this point which let's start with that actually because that's probably a good starting point so there we go that's zero Ackerman angle no matter what we're basically creating a steering knuckle geometry um, and actually this rod, which, oh no, can I not, hold on. I gotta grab these rods and extend them out a bit, because that's gonna go there. There we go, perfect. So that's good. Uh, that can be rigid, that's fine. And again, same thing on this side. I, I forgot how much I love this game. This game is actually amazing. I, I really should have, you know, not taken so much of a break. We still have a lot of chassis stuff to work on. We got a lot of different suspension types to check out. We got different methods of braking. You can see we got our rear axle here with the differential setup. Lots more cool stuff to check out in this game. We also got to build a gearbox into this thing. But again, combustion engines, gonna be great. No pressure on the dev, of course. You know, obviously the dev's got a lot of work. Um, and it's, you know, it's a very difficult project to work on. But I think it's going to be super, super cool when combustion engines get added. And we're going to have a different torque curve. And we're going to be able to make cars that, you know, actually have that different styles of engine. Inline fours, you know, V8, stuff like that. I think it's going to be really, really cool. Um, so we're just going to mount these. These are going to be our, our wheels. You know, our wheel mounting points. I guess I can keep that as three. doesn't really matter. Done. Perfect. And let's put that there on a rotating joint. And same thing here. Right. So that is our wheels. Perfect. Uh, and then we just got to mount another top bar like this to connect that up. It's really, really cool, the uh, the copy-paste building in this game. It's super great stuff. And yeah, obviously we have all those built-in knuckles as well with specific geometries. But, you know, it's cool that we can just build our own knuckle, no problem. So that needs to be a swivel point. That could be rigid. That could be rigid, no problem. That is rigid. That's all good. Uh, and then again, same thing here. We do it on this side. That's that. This should be like this. Done. Excellent. So now the last thing we got to do is just connect these up to these. And that's our steering geometry. So we'll bring that bar up. Bring this bar up. And then we'll put uh, another, another rod connecting this up. And uh, we could easily add suspension to this. Obviously, we allow these two points to pivot. These would also have to have a pivot point as well, because if you know, if these are pivoting this way, uh, then this would obviously, this would tilt our wheel. Our wheel would camber as it goes up and down. So we would have to have these as a horizontal pivot as well. Uh, so the whole thing would act like a double wishbone, and hence why this works fine as it's rigid. But if we tried to make it, you know, not rigid, it would, it would be a problem. So we just have to change the geometry a little bit, or use a ball joint connection up here as well. We could do a ball joint here, a ball joint here. That would work fine, and then it could pivot no problem. But again... 
I'm trying to focus on one task at a time, which is Ackerman Angle, and really see how it works. In the last video, uh, when we did sort of all the pieces all at the same time, it was a little hard to sort of see the direct effect of one piece versus the other, because, you know, obviously, um, you know, we're, we're changing like five different things simultaneously, and that's not, it's not really a good way to, to do any sort of scientific analysis. So there we go, that goes into there, and then this one goes into here. And now all we need to do is this needs to pivot, that needs to pivot, that needs to pivot, and that needs to pivot. And I believe that's it. That pivots on that bar, that pivots, no, this one needs to pivot on that bar. All right, so now that we've got this set up parallel, let's try running a lap. So right off the bat, what we should see is that the car is going to take some radius when it turns, you know, some radius, whatever the heck that radius is going to be. And uh, it's going to turn at that radius, no problem. So if I just go nice and slow here, and I crank this radius all the way to the left. That's what the car is going to take. It's going to take, you know, some specific radius based on its speed. But the inside wheel, you can see, is rotating. It should be rotating a little bit more than what that radius is. And the outside wheel should be rotating a little bit less than what that radius is. And the car is going to basically take some kind of an average between the two. But at the end of the day, the inside wheel is actually taking a sharper radius than what we're, we're actually taking. And as a result, it's going to have a bit of a sliding that happens. And the outside wheel is actually taking a shallower radius than what the car is actually taking. And uh, that means we're sliding as well on that wheel, but in a different direction. And it's kind of hard to explain. It's sort of hard to visualize. But at the end of the day, you know, our car takes a specific radius. And just because of simple geometry, which is like the width of our wheels, you know, the, the outside wheel is on a completely different curve than the inside wheel. And as a result, the whole car wants to slide a little bit because neither of the two wheels is really getting full traction through the corner, right? And that wasn't too bad of a lap, to be honest. But basically, each wheel is, is doing slightly, something slightly different than what the car is actually running. Now, on one of my drift cars, I actually had an inverted Ackerman angle before when I started running it. And that wasn't intentional. That was just completely set up wrong and accidentally, like one of my RC drift cars. And what happened when I had the inverted Ackerman angle is that when the car would actually try and take a corner and I would try and fling it into a drift, the actual car would just spin out like crazy because my outside wheel was constantly over rotating compared to my inside wheel. And that's actually a really, really big problem. And with, with RC drift especially, you need an Ackerman that's steep on the inside wheel and not as aggressive on the outside wheel. So your front wheels don't slide, they actually maintain grip and go through the corner. If your front wheels are sliding, that's a problem. You want your back wheels to be sliding. And your front wheels, they'll slide a little bit in drift. But at the end of the day, when you're coming through a corner drifting, you have your front wheels turned completely in the opposite direction. And they're at like an 85 degree angle or an 80 degree angle. And they're maintaining that drift through that corner. So the Ackerman angle is very, very important in RC. And it was completely wrong when I initially set up my car. So now what we're going to do is we're going to do something really, really crazy. And we're going to go to like the steepest possible Ackerman angle I can think of. So let's take this bar here bring it all the way back and then we're going to take this bar and put it there and then we're going to take this and put it there and we're going to do the same thing on this side and this is going to be insanely aggressive like this is going to be nuts how how aggressive this is going to go all right perfect so now if we get in the car we should see something extreme oh it's that might be that might be i might have got oh i did too much i did see i did too much too much Ackerman angle hold on yeah no that's okay i figured that was going to be too extreme the, uh, the member is too short for the amount that our steering angle moves. So let's just move it out one bar there and try this a little bit different. Uh, there we go. And let's do the same thing here. Yeah, I figure that might be a little bit too much. And uh, that's actually a problem with the RC cars as well. With the geometry that you have, the, the length of each member. If you overdo the, uh, the Ackerman, you can do that where your wheel invert lock, basically. Where it goes past the point of, of swivel and then it just completely dies. So let's see if this is enough. There we go. So now look at the difference between the inside radius and the outside radius. The inside radius is much, much steeper than that outside radius. And this should maintain wheel grip through corners a lot better. So let's reset the clock here. And let's just pull up to the line and see if this gives us a smoother drive through each corner. Now, of course, we have that rear differential as well, which kind of handles the sort of Ackerman thing on the rear side. It's not really Ackerman on the rear, but with the... the the differential, our inside wheel is allowed to spin less than our outside wheel as we go through a corner. It's actually really, really cool if you think about the way geometry works with this, um, because, you know, every corner you take, no matter what, you're going to have a little bit of difference. And now, it actually, you can see that it drives much, much better through the corner. It's still a little low on the grip, which is kind of interesting, 
but it actually drives like a lot smoother through these corners. It doesn't, and if I break during a corner, it doesn't want to immediately spin out, although that one was a little drifty, but it's a much different geometry now. It's kind of cool how all this stuff works. I really, really love this kind of thing. But I think this, if I'm just like from feel, I know it's hard to tell in a video because, you know, you guys aren't really, you know, driving it with the inputs, but I can tell you right off the bat, this feels like a much smoother drive. Uh, even though I'm overdoing a bit of the corners, but I'm able to go a lot faster into the oh until I spin it Yeah, no, I tapped the brake too much completely locked that rear axle But yeah, I'm able to actually kind of push it a little bit harder through each corner And I don't really feel like I'm losing the grip as easily because you're not really sliding both front wheels And that inside wheel is taking that tighter radius than that outside wheel. It's really really cool geometry I really love uh, that this game lets you kind of do all this stuff and it actually has an effect on the way your vehicle drives I gotta stop locking my rear axle though. That is nuts. All right. Well, we're just we're just going up here now All right, let's go back to the start and let's do the other end Which is the inverted Ackerman, which I think is just gonna be absolutely ridiculous. Maybe it'll be better for gear blocks I don't know Gear blocks the wheels are sliding a little bit because we don't have suspension and we're not getting that outside wheel loading So next episode we'll probably have to jump into some suspension right away and look at some different suspension and uh, mount some suspension to this because I think suspension will really start to make a difference once we have suspension on the front and rear axles and have it independent on each of the four wheels. That's going to make a huge difference because now we're going to load the car. As we go through the corner, all the weight will shift to the outside and we're going to actually load up the chassis, which of course is going to change the friction on the outside wheel versus the inside wheel and we just completely snapped that thing against the wall. So let's go back here and let's set it up with an inverted Ackerman. I can tell you right off the bat, just from feel, the standard Ackerman works way better than just completely parallel wheels. Um, but to do the inverted, we're going to have to do something a little bit weird, which I think it'll let me do. We're going to have to take this bar and put it out there. And this will go there. And that goes there. So now our steering attachment point is outside of the pivot point of the actual knuckle itself. Which is just, it's just going to be, this is going to be really weird. This is going to feel really, really silly. But what we should see here is that the outside wheel actually turns in at a steeper radius than the inside wheel. And that's just, you know, totally messed up. But here we go. So now if I turn this this way, we turn to the left. You can see that outside wheel is at a steeper radius than the inside wheel. And here the opposite happens, right? It's kind of hard to tell. Okay, I need to, let, let's make a change here. Let's just make this a little bit more exaggerated. So we're gonna bring this knuckle in and then push this out. All right, so should be something like that. Let's just make sure our wheels are attached correctly. So there we go, like this. Put a pivot point there, perfect. Oh, okay, actually, let's, let's do this symmetrical. So let's go pivot on the wheel point. Let's make sure this one's attached as well. And just do that, and then like that, perfect. And then, of course, let's make sure all these have their swivels. So that's got a swivel, that's got a swivel, and that's swiveling, and that's swiveling. Perfect. So now you can see, like, look at the angle that we've got here. It's absolutely ridiculous. And then one last thing I want to do to really exaggerate this is we're going to make the steering rack a little bit longer. So we're going to try and just, let's just move this out of the way for now. So we're just going to do this and get a bigger steering rack. And then that way it'll, uh, it'll hopefully really exaggerate the movement a little bit more. So let's get rid of this guy. And let's go look through our parts and see what we have. Should never have a steering rack this big, but there we go. That'll slide along that. Let's put this guy in there. Put this guy in here. This is this is gonna be perfect. This is gonna be awesome. And hopefully we'll see like a really steep inverted Ackerman angle, which is just absolutely hilarious. Now my RC car, when I had inverted Ackerman angle, it was really hard to spot. And the reason why is it was only happening when the suspension was loaded. Which means, like, as I was going through corners and the suspension would compress because of the camber geometry and the angle of the wheels and all the push bars and stuff, it would compress the suspension up, which would bring the camber in a little bit, make the wheels a little bit more parallel to the, you know, 90 degrees to the ground. But then it would also, as it would do that, the, the steering rod would kind of shorten a little bit, which would cause the Ackerman to go inverted and the outside wheel would be way more than the inside wheel, which of course is what caused it to uh, to spin out. Now let's see if we can adjust this. Uh, max RPM, max torque, trim angle zero. Um, where is my, oh, here we go, my angles. Max forward angle, let's just crank those up as high as we can. This might actually not have enough, not have enough steering to do this. But anyway, let's see. So if we go all the way this way, 
There we go. And you can see, you can kind of tell now, the outside wheel is turned in sharper than the inside wheel. I need, I need, hold on. I need a bigger gear on this stupid steering rack now. I can't actually, this little servo motor can't put enough angle out there to do this. Okay, hold on. So we got to move the servo motor up. That was a spur gear one. 1. 1.5 is probably good enough. Something like this. Yeah, and then we'll delete that, I think, because now we don't need that. And we can take this and copy it up. And then I think now this can go here. This can go there. Yeah, we can move this forward, but I think this is the right height now. Whoops. Something like that. And then I think... Let's just make sure this is all... Right, that's meshed. It's not meshed. Hold on, I need to go up one more gear size. No big deal, spur gear two. There we go, now it's meshed. All right, so now, yeah, now we should see, there we go. Now you can really see the effect of it. So the outside wheel, look at the radius that thing has versus the inside wheel. So this would be an inverted accurate 100%. That inside wheel is, is very, very shallow and the outside wheel is very, very steep. Again, this is more like what an F1 car would do because they're all accounting for the sliding forces coming across it. So let's reset one more time and let's see if this gives us a better lap. Oh my god, this, you know what? Look at how sharp, this might actually be the way to go for race cars. Maybe, maybe the F1 guys got something right. Oh boy. Like I said, your standard car doesn't do that. Your standard car, if you ever don't believe me, you can go out and take a look at your, your car and you can turn the wheels all the way to one side, measure the angle each wheel is at, and then go turn your wheels to the other side. And you'll see the inside wheel should turn more than the outside wheel. And, and again, the reason why is they don't want the tires to slide at all. They want the tires to maintain perfect grip going through every corner. But with an F1 car, they're accounting for the fact that you're going way too fast through every corner and you are sliding. Oh, I'm a big fan of this already. Oh boy, this might actually be like the way to go because Gearbox is really more about racing. But here we go. Let's see what this can do. That's, oh, that's so good. Uh-oh, okay, okay. You guys might be right. I Inverted Ackerman might be where it's at for race cars. This might be, this might be the thing, but let's just slow into this corner. I think we're going to have a really steep turning rate. Oh, no, see, it just slides. It just, it, you know what? We might need suspension to do it. At slow speeds, it's really, really good, though. At slow speeds, you get a really tight... Actually, it's pretty good still. It does slide a lot more. You can see that. With the regular Ackerman, our wheels aren't being slid around. They're actually, like, sort of maintaining grip as they go through the corner. With this, we're almost, like, snow plowing our outside wheel, where it's requiring way too much lateral friction that it just doesn't have. It's causing the wheels to slide more. We're not really spinning out, though, which is good. But, yeah. And even when I brake, it doesn't really spin out, which is interesting. But you can tell it, it definitely it definitely doesn't take as tight a turning radius. It really just power slides that wheel. That's so interesting. That's such a cool phenomenon that this uh, this game reflects that in such a cool way. But yeah, it's not uh, not nearly as good of a race car as when we had the standard Ackerman angle set up. The uh, the inverted is definitely worth. Now that being said, of course, I know there's going to be a lot of people in the comments. I'm really curious to see what you guys think about this in the comments. Because obviously there is going to be a lot of changes when you add suspension and you start loading the weight of the car. When the car loads a little bit, there's very, very different things that happen. And again, like I said, with RC cars, when we're working on drift cars, we actually do sort of do steering checks where we'll load the car with like one of our fingers. And oh my god, it, see, look at the snap oversteer there. You just turn a little bit and it just wants to over-rotate. But yeah, when we do RC cars, we do have that a lot where we'll, we'll look at, um, you know, what our steering angle is when the car's unloaded what the steering angle is when the car's loaded. So we'll we'll basically put all the batteries and stuff in the car, which weighs it down and gives it a little bit of suspension compression initially. And then we'll take our finger and we'll push the car down and we'll see when you load the car with weight in the front or you load the car with weight in the back, what happens to the suspension and what happens to all your steering geometry and things like that. And it's very, very important because when you're accelerating, you're going to load towards the back, right? You're going to push more weight to the back of the car when you accelerate. And as a result, your rear suspension is going to compress and your front suspension is going to unload a little bit. And when you do the opposite, when you decelerate, when you do some braking, like when you're going into a corner, your front suspension is going to compress more and your rear suspension is going to unload. And all those different changes in geometry make a big, big difference in terms of how your car actually drives through a racetrack. And of course, when you're braking, oh god, this thing is a spin, spin city. 
It's it kind of spins just as bad as my RC card did when I had inverted Ackerman. That's so interesting. But yeah, when you're when you're going through a corner and things like that, you want to make sure that the geometry as you like, for example, if I break into a corner, I don't want my Ackerman angle and my camber to get so screwed up in the front that I lose control of my car just because I'm braking, which is seemingly what happens with this thing. Whenever I try and brake, the, not only do we have only brakes on the rear axle, but the entire front axle just gets all messed up because that outside wheel is just sort of causing us to launch into a spin. You can see there, it's, it's a little bit okay. I will say this, the inverted Ackerman does let us catch it a little bit easier. But, you know, let me know what you guys think in the comments down below. Obviously, it's a little bit different. I know we still have a lot of things to do on this chassis. What I think I'm going to do next episode is we're going to go back to sort of like a standard Ackerman. We'll do it with a, you know, a standard front Ackerman. Not much. We'll use one of the default knuckles that the dev has. And we'll start playing around with suspension. We'll put some suspension on the front, suspension on the rear. And we'll look at suspension stiffnesses maybe and see what happens and how it works when we load the car laterally inside to outside, front to back, etc. And then we also have to look at weight distribution front to back on a car. With our RC drift cars, we're about 35-65, 35% of the weight in the front, 65% of the weight in the rear. And obviously that's because we're rear wheel drive, rear braking, and we want the rear to really fling out out and maintain momentum but there are differences in all sorts of cars and you know there's different weight setups and it's really really cool to check that out so let me know what you guys think in the comments down below make sure of course you hit that like button hit that subscribe button and as always i hope you guys enjoyed this video and we'll see y'all next time